we uh, came out with um, a book, um, Material Landscapes. I don't know if you've seen it, Monticelli Press, mm -hmm. and um, which was a really great experience because that was a lot about um, you know figuring out who you are. I mean, uh, sometimes I think probably you guys know as well as you work uh, all the time and sometimes, and you're building these, um, all these amazing projects and working with really interesting people and making it all happen. Sometimes you need to take that breath to see what you have actually done. Right. And, um, <laughs> that's what the book really was for us was this moment to realize who we were and where we come from. And, you know, also probably project a little bit of where we want to go next. And, um, because the book wasn't sort of written as a tome of end all, be all, this is surface design bunk. It, it was more, um, this is just a snapshot of the journey that we're taking. Um, and so in some ways it was super enlightening um, to see the diversity of the work and that, you know, our ethos of that, we're, we're really not the, the big signature kind of design office, you know, where you can obviously tell that was a surface design project. Hmm. Um, and so, because we'd worked and been there for many, uh, of those types of firms. And so for us, it was not interesting because it negates what the place is. I mean, uh, putting a signature just for a signature, it doesn't really work when, um, the, environment that you're placing it in is radically different from the next and, and that and that relationship with the, both the client and the place and the culture that each project is set in really starts to determine what the form and and how it feels and how one would engage with these landscapes um so if so that was very important for us that 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 connection or possibilities of opening up the way that one could engage with landscapes because they relate more to who you or where you are in the world. So that, that really, um, the book I think illustrated to us that uh, we're all over the map. And I think in some ways we really appreciate, um, that diversity and, and scale. Um, and we've done everything from Auckland's International Airport to, and which is the lead into the whole country of New Zealand to, you know, a couple of really interesting backyards where you have hot tubs that have covers that we've designed that run through the entire garden and transform themselves into decks and bars and everything else <laughs> uh, in, a, in a playful manner just to solve um on a small scale, someone's need that wanted a hot tub and a maintenance free garden. And so we're sort of up for all the challenges. Um, the more challenging I think sometimes the project is, the, the, the more we enjoy it and figuring out the solutions that people may not have thought of before, just because, um, I think we like, we have, we like to sort of, that's a horrible frame out the think outside the box, but it's, it's more like let's reimagine this world because I think in some ways the world that we live in so much has been set by traffic engineers and mm -hmm. uh, box checkers and lead and whatever you want to make up to, to make you feel good that you're doing something. Um, really starts to, you know, create a place that is just repetitive and not interesting. And I think for us, it's all about making connections and, and piquing people's curiosities. We want you to think about what's around the bend and not what's right in front of you. And because you've seen it a million times, you're going to completely ignore it or even question what it is. Right. And in some ways, the landscapes that we try and connect to really do uh, outreach to one's ad imagination and um, and to pique that uh, like curiosity of what is that and why is it like that? And um, and that's why we in, in some of the more larger urban projects, we 
we look at those elements that are so mundane that, you know, like the six by six concrete curb that is everywhere in this entire planet and question, well, why does it have to be there and why do you have to paint it red? Uh, so you don't stop there. Like those single elements, if you think about them, if you designed a sexy curb um, that might have, you know, a materiality to it that is more uh, genuous to the place and it's legible and it's robust um, that you can transform even just your, your everyday sort of experience. And I think that's why we challenge everything that sort of comes at us. Uh, in, in that way, not in a challenge to be challenged way, but, but in challenge to like be provocative in a way that will make one think. I think in some ways we have been sort of numb or been made numb by the, the environment that has been created uh, by the box checkers. And mm-hmm. I think um, we're trying to fight for poetry and beauty to be reinstated uh, as the motivating force uh, rather than um, how many rebar and, and uh, it, that's not the right yellow warning strip. Um, thing, things can be done a different way. And, and, and for us, like our office, is, um, the challenges are, are, are really high when you are working with some of these bureaucratic agencies. And so the reimagining our offices, we, we promote universal access so that everybody can visit all the parts of the site, even more than what's outlined in the ADA. But it's not done through bot dots and uh, handrails and curbs and everything. It's, it's done through a grading exercise that doesn't need those kinds of things. So it's the sort of problem solving and, and solutions that remove the impediments. So I mean, there's nothing worse than, and we've all been there, right? You go, out, go up to a building and there's this zigzag ramp with handrails and everything. And it, it's actually more of a barrier than a, an access point. So yeah. we reimagine those kinds of conditions. In some ways it's the sort of, and not to bore people about like ADA ramps, but you know, people just, it's something like, Oh, check the box. We need to have that because we have a grade change, but maybe we could do it differently. Yeah. is what we're trying to promote. Yeah, no, definitely. There's a lot of stuff to unpack there. Um, oh, what a wonderful start. Uh, so the first thing I, I want to ask, uh, based of, of all the things you said is, um, you mentioned that you know, as an office, you, you the the two or the three of you rather were pretty clear about having a certain kind of approach or an openness to the different types of projects you're going to take on, and an openness yeah. to the site, and not forcing a style or forcing your own manifesto, you know, on every project. And I'm I'm and certainly you know that's parallel to many professions in architecture. Of course, we have plenty of architects who have their uh, shtick, we could call it. We have architects who operate more in the way that you're talking about. In the world of landscape architecture, is it generally uh, taught that you're you're meant to be approaching projects projects the way you do? Do most offices, uh, by your you know readings, operate the way you do, or what is that balance like? I think it's it's hard. Uh, it, there there is, of course, there's no gross generalizations of any kind of. Uh, profession, but um, I think a lot of our profession of landscape architects, starting from Olmsted down, really that define the profession, Mm -hmm. um, have come through a series of schools um, that is not that many compared to architecture, but have promoted different kinds of ways. I mean, I, uh, we both, uh, Roderick and I went to the GSD, so graduate school design, and you know, it's a very modernist pedagogy. And so, yes, I would say the and Jeff too, who, who went to UCLA, um, really do have the sort of uh, the time and point that we went through education uh, was, was sort of um, grounded in that modernism. And so like I have a, prof- a degree from uh, architecture from USC 
And for me, it was a very exciting period because all my professors were like Pierre Koenig and, um, oh. and, um, then I had uh, John Mutley, who was a, a British, you know, from the, the AA. And then, and then we had at the same time this influx of all these young characters, um, that were very much a part of that had worked for Frank Gehry right when Frank Gehry was going. So you had this collision of, say, strict modernist and let's just say the intuitive um, way of looking at the world. And so when you're at that precipice of two different minds and thinking and being exposed to that, um, you just that, that diversity makes your brain a lot uh, you know, more um, um, uh, thoughtful about that there's more than one way of looking at this world. Right. And, and so I think within, to get back to your question about, are there many people that look that way? I think uh, landscape um, ha- has had a very he- heavy hand in the signature part of the world uh, in, in design. And, and I think that was more of a direct relationship of, again, um, the profession trying to, um, I don't want to say compete, but to, to, to be on the same level at that time period with architecture, which was also sort of the black cape signature. Mm-hmm. And so the profession for a long time sort of tried to struggle to be seen. And, and that was a mechanism to minimalism or however you want to do it, um, was structured that way there. And then there was a, an interesting moment with Ian McCard where there was a, uh, all that sort of got blown out of the water when there was a whole notion of, of ecology entering in and that things should be socially minded and mm-hmm. all this. And that sort of blew up. And then, uh, then there, to be honest, there was quite a period during the eighties where the profession just, we lost so many people. Uh, during that period that there's almost a whole generation that uh, should have slipped in right after the, the signature landscape architects, but, but didn't um, due to a whole bunch of things, recessions and all that, mm-hmm. that um, left a big gaping hole. And so uh, for us, and we're part of sort of a, the, that next generation. And I think you're always sort of challenging your parents, right? So I think that that notion of of the signature and, and doing it differently um, came into more prominence, I think, when our generation come, came in. And there wasn't that many of us. And so that's sort of interesting, too, to see the next wave I think you, you talked to uh, David Godshaw, who uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, an amazing character, who um, and and Alan Pawa, which was our employee number one. You know that next generation has another sort of uh, attitude and, and excitement about the way it is that that hopefully that we had influenced in how to think beyond the circle and the stripe and to think about um, placemaking in, with. Um, both an intuitive approach, but but also a, a, a functional um, approach at the same time. And it's interesting to see how the how the next group is going because this, luckily we've had this big boom of um, of uh, not wealth but a prosperity for a little while, and and so it allows the, the the younger firms to survive where in the past that hasn't been. Case. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited about what, uh, what is going on with our profession and doing talks like this and everything and promoting uh, who what landscape uh, architecture does and on all the multiple levels of both social, e- ecological, and placemaking and design and poetry and 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 is really uh, important and that's. Uh, I'm excited about this period, even, even though we're all in. And in some ways, this pandemic is, is really opened, I think, a lot of people's eyes towards uh, the landscape. I mean, people are stuck in their homes and that backyard that they've neglected and full of weeds, you know, all of a sudden they're taking an interest because it's safer to be outside than it is uh, inside. And so 
they're coming to to recognize that the importance of what uh, that that um, part of their lives is, and and I think for us as landscape architects, I mean, we've always been sort of you know what what's next into the future, and and what we've been interested in, and, and we've again, uh, I think responses to um, situations like this are really important because they can become a catalyst. Um, for change in, on so many levels, as we all hope. Um, but even in landscape terms, uh, you know, when you're told that you have social distancing of six feet and your sidewalk is only five feet wide, yeah. uh, that becomes problematic. So what happens to our cities and, and the next transformation becomes really important in landscape. Architecture should be looking towards that. Um, we ourselves, in San Francisco here working with the city to actually convert some of these streets into parks. And, yeah. uh, and I think that becomes really important because what happens if you really think about the built environment and I go back to my friendly, uh, um, engineers who have sort of created the traffic engineers that have created the environment we're in, you think about it, it's a car dominated, uh, situation. And then uh, you have the bike people who have fought super hard to get their little piece of pavement and are only now just sort of being, uh, uh, getting some traction, uh, let's say, to to think about bikeways, especially the transformations of of New York and various larger cities that has happened with bikeways. But you know who's been left out on the curb or in the dust is our pedestrians. (laughs) Yeah. Um, it's really sort of sad that we ourselves are the last to sort of um, think about our own. Um, and so I do think that we need to radically rethink uh, the pedestrian uh, engagement with the city. Yeah. And a little bit more balanced approach about um, how we move through. And, you know, we we ourselves are, are um, I mean, you can talk to a landscape architect and we sort of always know uh, the connection to nature and love of plant materials and, and environments that are living um, in po- opposed to static are, are scintillating and, and mind uh, provoking. But, you know, we've, we've always sort of struggled in having a tool to, to let people know the importance of landscape because mm-hmm there's always that tree that's going to drop stuff on my driveway. I'm going to cut it down. But right. once you try and give a metric, which is the part of the problem with it, I, I dislike so much is this creating a metric to say that, well, that tree's worth this increasing your property value is $5,000. I really don't want people to be thinking about that, even though that's a true statement is that your, your properties or values will go up if you're sitting on a tree line street opposed to one with no trees. Um, but what I'm more interested in is some of the, is some of the studies that are coming out of Stanford that where it really, there are now documented tests that, you know, they, they literally took a class and split it in half and had half the students go in, you know, park in the parking lot and walk into the classroom and have class. And then the other half, they actually made them walk through a landscape, the Arboretum, which is a more forested landscape. And literally they tested both of the student groups and, and the, the brain and the capacity to learn was so much uh, more increased by the ones that actually took a walk in nature hmm. that, you know, these kinds of studies, I think is really interesting to see the impact on our lives and how important landscape is. And so as we move forward with technology and everything else, I think this, uh, r- relationship uh, becomes even more key. And that's what we need to sort of promote is how do you interject landscape into places where people can have those walking meetings for 10 minutes or you know, converse with people as they bump into them safely six feet apart. <laughs> right. <laughs> these, you know, it's yeah. like this, these, these moments need to be uh, increased, uh, especially as as we know with the Zoom meetings and everything, you literally want to pull your hair out by the end, but because of the lack of human contact. But some of that lack of human contact can be remedied by contact with nature. And right. the 
and when it's nature, it's not only just the physical, but it's also the the smell of nature, you know, the fragrance, the connections, the wildlife, the animal life and, and flora and fauna that come together. And that's why some of these things that we're doing in San Francisco, looking at pollinator pathways where you can leverage off these uh, linear parks and run them up buildings. We're doing uh, uh, this, this building uh, for uh, this one developer, and we literally have incorporated different terraces at different heights based on how, how high will a hummingbird fly or a butterfly or whatever, and then creating those kinds of habitats for them because they really, you know, is as one knows, it's not just us in this world. And the, the, the more you include, the richer and and um, the environment is going to get, and the healthier it's going to get. And um, and for all, like I always quote for those maintenance guys that don't want to do anything, is you just mow and blow. I'm like, well, look, you know, if you do the get the soil right and you get the plant right, selections right, and you create the habitat, they actually take care of themselves. Hmm. So fiscally, it's a smart move. To approach projects that way so and then it sounds sort of funny you know fiscally way with a landscape architect but you know you that's the beauty of what our profession really is is that we cover so many different hats from architecture to to ecologists to soil scientists to we just get exposed to absolutely everything to make sure that the success of something that is a living thing become so important. So um, dialogues and, and I think for ourselves as a firm, going to different parts of the world, whether it's New Zealand or Mexico or, or designing the master plan of the Smithsonian Institute with Bjarke Ingels, it's sort of like, yeah, you can, all that knowledge from all these different places can then be applied to these different kinds of situations. And then layered in with the history and placemaking and you know, working with characters like Bjarke or whoever, um, then fold into that process and just make these hopefully very rich environments. In the, some ways, I always love it when uh, the unexpected happen because you'll design something and then you'll see when the public engages it with it in a totally different way than you thought or even imagined um, it just becomes this amazing uh, swell of warmth and happiness inside ourselves that that we've created something that people engage with and want to be on and, and, and are taking it over right. Uh, right at the same time. You know, the homogeneity of kind of the, the built environment, the, the exterior public areas uh, that you were describing, um, I mean, I get partly why it's there, you know, there's kind of health and safety reasons. And I think what you're saying makes sense is that you, if you let those dictate uh, the design, basically, of an exterior space too much, you end up with probably what we have now, uh, health, safety, and also cost, uh, being cost effective. Those are probably the three, That's three killers. Uh, always uh, one word lurking in the, in the dark. Right. <laughs> so I, what, I, I'm curious, like what, um, uh, What's preventing us from having uh, public streets, uh, exterior parks, uh, and and all these other spaces that are more like the ones that you'd like to see, the things that you're trying to that you are that you are describing, and and do you think that you know the the Stanford research you mentioned is is really fascinating? Is research like that and the public awareness of it is that going to be, you know, a key part of of kind of solving this problem? Yeah, I, 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 yes, absolutely. I mean, more public awareness of uh, what's going on. And, and the funny thing about this is being locked up and having your, at six o'clock, doing your walk. Um, uh, it's interesting, in, at least in our neighborhood in San Francisco, there's a series of tiny little parks everywhere, and they're just inundated with people, all separated, of course. But, mm -hmm. but the, I think people are getting, again, this more appreciation of what um, public open space has to offer and uh, and to make those connections. So I think the opportunity here and now to talk about studies like that and to promote these sort of green connections within a urban environment become really important now. 
I think the biggest obstacles that we find and why we ended up with we have is that it's it's really the um, traffic engineers and um, planners that um, really have a formula. You know, they it's tried and true. They've run it out. They've never had a problem, whatever. And it's just easy to do what one has always done yeah. rather than challenge or rethinking it in a, in a more meaningful way. Um, I, I do think it's also, um, you know, the public sector, I mean, the private sector a little bit. Um, you've got really great people that are challenging these things, but when it, it starts going through the mill, so if you challenge anything of outside the norm, you had your process of getting approvals or, or moving it through um, are lengthened, yeah. and you know time is unfortunately money for a lot of projects. So rather than maybe challenge or doing something different or doing it maybe the right way, will uh, be more expensive. So they're just not willing to invest in that. I think when you start to see um, cities. I would say like Auckland, New Zealand, who really um, get uh, champions uh, there that in places of, uh, let's just say, power of city making, um, you can make that transformation because they too have the typical engineered um, approach to everything and um, they got in there and decided, no, we are going to reimagine the streets. We're going to uh, test shared streets where you have streets where people, bikes and cars all commingle at the same plane. Mm-hmm. And the character of the, the sidewalks, or they call them footpaths, uh, is uh, of a, a materiality that, that is from the place. So the, all their curbs are basalt curbs because New Zealand is a uh, you know a volcanic uh, island, and so you you start to get um, the psyche change because yeah. now you're co mixing all these cars are slowing down, people are getting a little more aware, but they're more confident that they can circulate unimpeded in in ways. Uh, that um, make them enjoy the environment rather than running from corner to corner trying not to get killed. And so <laughs> that's, part, um, that's part of the this, fun, though. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Depends on how many points you want. But yeah, I mean, I think um, it is a different way. But but they, you know, they're, they're using things like drainage swales to delineate where the cars go. Mm-hmm. You know, and and but they're subtle and, or a rustication of stone material. And then the whole pavement systems are stone. There's, they're not, as soon as you integrate asphalt, um, the highway mentality then sets in. Yeah. And so that, you know, you're going to, your speeds are going to go up. You're, you know, you, you are aware of that. That means you can go fast. Yeah. Whereas when you're on an alternative material, whether it's stone or gravel or whatever it may be, um, it, 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 gives you a visual or audio clue that you're not no longer the king of the road and yeah. that you have to be thoughtful about how you're moving through this. And, um, I think cities like Auckland understand that and have been very successful in, in, you know, uh, there's projects there, you know, if I went into any city in the U S and would propose this, you know, including integrated stormwater management through wetlands and, and all this, you know, they look at you funny and say, there's no way this, yeah. this would ever happen. This is no, no, no. How do you do this? And then they would put up thousands and thousands of roadblocks, um, to tell you, you can't do something. And, and when you have a city with a champion that's forward thinking and, and building off experiences that are happening in London and other places of the world, um, it is achievable yeah. and it is exciting to see that transformation. And, I- People are happier. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Um, they're not scared. They're happy. And I think that's the way we should start to think about um, making or remaking streets. Because in some ways, you, you can't get rid of the cars. Well, obviously, being in L.A., there's no way. <laughs> 
or me being Los Angelino and there's no way you know, to do that. But if you, but, but at some point we will be in the future carless. We will have either the driverless cars, which I'm not going to take up as many lanes and asphalt that it does uh, currently, but it might um, make us rethink about, well, what is that interstitial space to in, in an urban condition? What does that become? Yeah, that's a good point because it's it's it really is the car, right? The automobile wasn't designed as a city as as a city vehicle, you know. I I, I mean it's pretty basic. The the cars are built to go really far distances, really fast, much faster than you need to within any kind of even large city, and we've kind of designed everything around that. And I almost wonder. And, and maybe this is a stretch, but I almost wonder if the kind of the car centric mentality that that a lot of American cities have has to do with the the cultural mindset of Americans in general. Uh, I think I, maybe 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 it's all the COVID-19 news I've been reading of people, people were refusing to wear masks, but we seem to be very individualistic. And I and I can just hear folks saying, like, how dare you, you know, tell me I can't have my car and my space that is very american you know <laughs> right <laughs> you know new zealand uh, you know it's a different place yes it is and you know and it's uh again they come from agrarian the majority of them are, are or farm farm stock at some point in their, their in their family's life and so you know that uh, pull up your britches and uh with a uh way of making things work on uh, a, a shoestring budget, um, but making done really efficient and function and, and which typically means that it's done in a very thoughtful way um, is in their ethos. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so it's actually funny uh, when you start to see things that the, I, I always tease Kiwis. They're the nicest people on the planet until you get them behind the wheel. <laughs> and uh, when they're on their highways, they're, yeah, I mean, they're on par with Italians, I think. Um, and what's interesting is I think it is that, that mentality of the road. It's fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm actually half Kiwi, so I, I've been visiting New Zealand um all my life and it's been fascinating to watch uh, the kind of influences that places like Los Angeles have um, basically the first point of entrance uh, that any uh, person from New Zealand traveling to the US or to Europe even was through Los Angeles mm -hmm. and so when you had this um, amazing freeway system that was set up in the 50s um, and that to them was progress that clearly influenced how they uh, integrated their sort of freeway network um, into Auckland. And I think they're right now um, trying to pull it apart because it literally has strangled the city uh, where uh, they've actually converted uh, full flyovers into bike lanes um, for, for, um, for a different mode of travel that, than, than the car. And so I think that chokehold, uh, they've come to that awareness, but I think we still have to learn it. We're, we're too um, comfortable in the way that we do things sometimes. And, you know, it, changing the, the, that thinking about travel becomes a really important thing. Because as you mentioned, uh, David, that you know, you're going at high speeds. So you're you're visiting landscapes or places at this speed that you can't really register the po poetry or the smaller scale things about that mm. because you're traveling it so quickly. But as soon as you slow it down with a bike, um, it becomes a really sort of interesting thing. Uh, my partner Roderick just bought an electric bike to move around in and he's experienced the landscape around Napa in a totally different way than, than was done previously in the car. So he, he's, he's going through zones of, of the vineyards or grasslands or into the urban, the neighborhoods at a speed that a human can actually register what's going on mm -hmm. and make people aware of their environment a lot more. And, I think that's true even if you 
or walking, but um, that's not happening right now in the cities. Uh, and I think we need to see how that change or adjustment in mobility can change the environment that you're in. Yeah, I want to go a little bit back um, because you have a, a bachelor's in architecture. Uh, mm -hmm. When you were before college, though, did you? How did you know that uh, you were going to be studying architecture? Um, well, I come from an entire family of structural seismic civil engineers, <laughs> and so uh, I was the black sheep of the family. <laughs> Architect. Um, I think um, I was actually very interested. I think in, in a couple things in making things. I think that my first memory was I wanted to become a chef before it was, you know, now it's all fancy to be a chef. But back then, you know, I was interested in that because it was sort of um, having that sort of all these just separate ingredients that you could work together to create something that would please people. And I think in some ways, you know, having an impact on people and engaging with them uh, was sort of important. And I think when it came to architecture, um, being an allied field, I mean, I was dragged to construction sites all my life. Uh, and I grew up in Palos Verdes, uh, which, uh, was, uh, which I did not know at the time that I started landscape architecture school, but it was actually designed by Olmsted. Hmm. Uh, it's one of the few, um, developments that was done by the Olmsted family uh, on the West coast. And, uh, it was a time when most of it was fields. And, um, it was, uh, you would play in the fields and catch frogs and lizards and all these kinds of things. But then over my lifetime, uh, each site would get developed by a construction site. So your next playground was construction sites and sand pits and all these kinds of things, um, that, uh, the construction queues and in the seventies used to leave around. And so it became, I think another sort of influence, uh, on me, uh, to get into the, the, the built world of architecture. And then you ended up studying architecture at USC, the university yeah. of Southern California. Um, mm -hmm. and you were there for the, it's five years, right? Yep. And then, interestingly, afterwards, you abandoned us. You abandoned us, and you and you <laughs> and you went to the GSD and studied landscape architecture. So, I, I am curious what that transition was like for you, and what happened internally. What what caused you to to decide that there's this other, you know, you know, tangential kind of uh, route that uh, would be interesting? Well, it it's funny how sort of history repeats itself. Sadly. Um, so when I went to USC, um, I graduated in 90 and, um, at that time, um, uh, uh, one of my professors was, uh, going to take a sabbatical and asked me to, uh, teach his class. Uh, and I was, uh, working, uh, for John Mutlow and we were doing affordable housing and farm worker villages. Uh, and it was, uh, just John and I, and so it was a sort of great sort of moment in, uh, in time, but it was also the start of the recession. And, um, and so with my best friend, we decided as little kids to basically start our own architecture firm. And <laughs> so, uh, on the, on the side, because the recession you back then you'd be working only four days a week, basically, or whatever you could pick up. And, and I had this teaching gig at the same time. So, um, so one of the first projects, uh, we got was a friend from USC, a project in, in, uh, Pasadena off of Orange Grove. Um, it was like a 10,000 acre, I mean, 10,000 square foot backyard. Um, and the irony of it all was that here we just come from architecture school, but I had actually started, um, working uh, as like a 15 year old, probably illegal uh, for a Japanese uh, nursery in, in uh, Palos Verdes, mm -hmm. which had links to Gardena, which is a very rich culture of Japanese farmers that turned to nursery people who are still there um, supplying plants for all the nurseries in Los Angeles. 
And so I worked there from 15 all the way through college doing, you know, uh, learning about plants because it was sort of a little bit like the karate kid. I had this very strong boss <laughs> and I had to learn every plant and every bug and every treatment and everything and sell Christmas trees that, in the winter um, that I was doing that because of the sort of sort of the love of, of working and, and being amongst uh, that family and, and, and participating and meeting people and selling plants and engaging people on a sort of a retail level was a sort of uh, an interesting thought hmm. that when this project came around, uh, I of course called uh, Elwood Hayashi and he said, sure, we can get the plants for you at a discount and you can sell them and plant them in this big garden. And then in the design of this pool and garden and garage and all that stuff, I realized, Oh, this is landscape architecture. Oh, I never really knew it existed, even though I had met Emmett Wimple and all this stuff, but it, it just didn't register as an opportunity. But, but the, really the clincher was, was when I was teaching at USC, this is 92, literally the riots um, broke out. Literally, I could visually see uh, the, the center point of when they pulled the guy out of the truck on Florence Avenue and I was sitting there on exposition and, and fig. And, uh, here I was, um, watching this and, you know, this whole class of students that were in my care and all of a sudden my city, uh, completely, which I love and still do completely turned to darkness. Mm. I mean, I don't know if you were around at that time, but, you know, L.A. for two weeks, we never saw the sun. I mean, it was full, thick smoke and uh, terror and instability and um, and things that I think that were balled up for many years or hundreds of years now that, that um, exploded at that time. Yeah. And it was sort of, you know, sort of shocking and, and it was important influence on myself because not only taking care of the kids or the students and getting them to sell places, but also, you know, moving within the city and seeing, um, looting and everything that was going on. And it just made me really question why, what, what you know, besides the social aspects that were happening, which at, at that age, I did not understand. Um, but, uh, you know, what was it you know, that was going on? And, and, and in my mind, how old were you? it was really that I realized that Los Angeles really has no open space. You have the beach and you have Griffith Park. And Griffith Park is basically a vertical rise that's very hard to occupy yeah. or hang yeah. in. And so there are no real public parks. There's no um, everything is asphalted concreted, stuccoed, and there were no trees at the time. There was just nothing. And you would, you, you would go into some of the older neighborhoods where the palm trees were or where the large trees, and, and, and those were amazing sort of experiences, but those were generally the, the richer neighborhoods. And so you literally could see the, the um, devastation, you know, and I was worked on part of rebuild LA at the time, um, to, to bring it back. But it, again, it just more and more, it hits you over the head that, that there is no relief valve. Hmm. There's no place for people to engage that, uh, on, on a large scale, there's no central park. There's no golden gate park. And, um, and in a sense, uh, that motivated me to rethink and I applied to the, to the GST in landscape architecture and in architecture, uh, with urban design. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, it was really that shock that, that your city and everything that you thought was could turn on a dime and, and to see it happen again now is, is, is heartbreaking. So I think again, I feel a lot more comfortable in a position now that the the experience and stuff that I've been fortunate to be to have can hopefully have a, a little more impact uh, 
and thinking about ways like we've been talking earlier, the transformation of cities after after the car goes or, or what what could that be? What's the future? Through green, through na- nature and, and integrating that into a city. How old were you when the uh, riots were happening? I was twenty. Uh, I was probably 21. Oh, wow. 22, somewhere like that. Yeah. yeah. So it was very, it, it had a huge impact. And um, in, in some ways, you know, this whole experience that I've been able to do, and, you know, my family's all in LA and everything, and, and, and we're so starting, we're working in LA right now. Um, so it, it's familiar, which is nice. But I think these bigger picture stuff, if with the knowledge and the education that I was able to get back east and the ability to work in all these crazy cities, I mean, after I graduated from the GSD, I, you know, I ended up with the Hargraves and I, I moved to Sydney to be one of the master planners of the Sydney Olympic Games. So that was a really interesting notion, too, of, of creating something for a large event. But really pushing the agenda that that we were talking about was, in essence, the Green Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just recounting yesterday, I, I you know that we had we created a large park that wrapped around the Olympic site, but also the Olympic Plaza as well. And part of one of the, the small aspects that was sort of my little pet project that I was really invested in was this one tiny little frog the green and gold billed frog, which is, um, was an endangered species that was found on the site. It was basically on the verge of completely collapsing. And so part of what I tried to do along with the ecologists and the wetlands people were to understand how this frog, what was its environment? How do you actually, um, 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 how do you, save or protect something that's so small. I mean, it's basically the size of your thumb. And uh, so I, I, I investigated what kind of habitat like, what its mating experiences were, uh, everything, like how it hung out, did like the sun itself, all this stuff. And we literally across all the Olympic site created these mini habitats. So I, half the time they're teasing me, you're, you're making these, these frog Disneylands uh, everywhere and, you know, protecting fence lines that could keep the frogs contained and not having them jump on roads and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it's funny, that was 20 years ago. And, uh, two years ago, I was invited to give a lecture in Sydney and, you know, that same group of people came up to me and said, you realize that that frog is no longer on the endangered list what you did so you know i think there's other ways that you can heal some of these wounds uh, and and protect species and or portions of our our, our, uh, world that we live in to create you know create the right kind of places for them to proliferate and uh, thrive and i think that's what we need to do now especially now. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't not agree with that uh, for sure. Uh, 20 years ago, that's a long time ago to be wanted to save tiny frogs. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's pretty amazing that you had that ambition and that you were successful. <laughs> yeah. Like really. Along with planting tons of forest, that's the, the, the funny thing about being a landscape architect opposed to uh, an architect was that um, with architecture, I could always have uh, immediate, you know, you know the materials, you can build your building and get your, get your things set. And, but with landscape, you, have, you plant trees and, and shrubs enough, and it takes years before they actually come to fruition and spatial uh, quality and, and that you, you want it to be in your vision or whatever. Um, and it's, it's fascinating when you um, go to places like um, – at the waterfront in in um, Lisbon for the World Expo in '98, and we planted these little trees that were like you know one foot tall. And I went there 15 years ago. I, I mean, it, they've been in for 15 years, and and they you know were hitting the skyline and the big bridge and the and you know the the um, it was a really it was a glow in the dark site, which is what I you know, really appreciate and love are these these toxic sites. Um, and, and bring them back to health. And 
it was amazing. We were walking on a boardwalk that I, you know, had done the sketch for, and and then you know the skate park, which everyone told me was no one would safety hazard, no one would want, but that's like the busiest part of the park. And then we got to the wetlands, and you know everyone said, well, what are you doing, planting grasses and weird plants along the edge? You know, this is you don't need to do that. Why would you do that? Waste time and effort and and land for mm -hmm. that and then to arrive there after the because it was part of a whole strategy we created for stormwater management and sewage treatment that uh before it spilled out into the bay the river the tej that um it was that you could do soft green technologies and approaches to that but the biggest thing for me was when i was on site a giant flock of flamingos came in and roosted and were walking around this wetland and they hadn't been seen there for the longest time. And so again, these sort of little things that you fight and challenge and, you know, the engineers wanted to do concrete ditches and I wanted to do wetland plains, um, that, you know, it has a bigger impact, um, in the health of the system. And now, you know, Lisbon enjoys that giant, uh, 200 hectare park. That used to be, you know, the landfill dump, uh, and they recreate, they play there, they have picnics, they have birthday parties. The the plants are cleaning the air. There's all this kinds of really basic stuff, but you know, you really have to argue and and uh, fight for that kind of stuff. And it's it's nice when you see the results in the end, and then you can point to it because half the time I think. People, again, how do you overcome the box checkers is that you have to prove to them that it is possible, that it is easy, and that it is maintenance-free. And then they'll sort of maybe entertain the fact that they can do it differently. And and that's part of why our little firm, and I know David's, um, really strive to, to push the envelope to make people think differently. Cause that's how you make change. You start there and then it'll ripple out. Yeah. Is that, um, probably one of the, the greatest motivating factors for you? Um, no, uh, not, not the greatest. I mean, it is a huge impact. I mean, I, I really can, how people engage with what you've done is really important. To, and, but I think it's also the process. Hmm. I think the process is really a, a very interesting, um, from collecting the data, uh, listening to people, especially listening to people, hearing their stories, seeing how the, what the site is. And when you're looking at the site, it's also the geology. How is the site built? Was it a volcanic eruption? Was it, is this a bottom of the ocean millions of years ago? Um, what was it? And then thinking about what it could become, like, what are, what are the, the elements of this community? Because a lot of times when you go to sites, the, the solutions are already sort of there. I mean, you drive the neighborhood, you can understand what tree species works really well or why and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, a lot of times it's listening to that uh, portion of it um, that becomes really important because what I found is that you know, people will grow up in a neighborhood and there will be an orchard around the corner or there's a street line trees from whatever leftovers. And what happens is um, the developers come in or they need to widen the street or whatever and they cut down all the trees or the orchard or the agriculture or whatever it was previously that was sort of ingrained in their psyche is gone. And they turn around, the next thing you see is like this environment that's not theirs, but they, they it's, it's like death by slow cut. They, they're used to it, but the end result is, is, you, is not good. And so by looking at a history of a site and protecting going in um, to a place and, and reading the landscape um, and the sort of moments where a hedgerow or whatever was, still struggling and fighting on that, that then you could build off of those landscape elements to reinforce what was there to make the park uh, successful because it's from the place and from, from what made the place. Um, so it's all these multiple different layers that go on. 
um, into that placemaking that I enjoy that process of investigation and sleuthing and uh, discovery uh, that is super exciting to me. Yeah, and hearing you talk about it, the the openness that you have, and visiting the site, and, and you know, you're talking about the history of a site, the 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 ecology of it, the 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 wildlife, the birds, the frogs, all these different aspects. I'm kind of want curious how that conversation uh, then gets translated to 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 have to be with the client who might not have an interest in these things or might maybe not even know about this frog or about the history of this place because because you're talking about some 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 in some cases some really specific things and other in other cases um, basically history and yeah. um, certainly I think if you have a, if you have a certain kind of social perspective it's easy to uh, let's say agree with what you're saying right but if it's not on your radar, it's difficult to pitch, I feel. And and where I'm coming from is I think like for architecture, maybe in a way it's easier because we can point to a rendering of a building and say, look, this is what it's going to look like. Isn't it pretty? Client says, yeah, yeah I think it's pretty. Then we move forward. But for something right. much more ephemeral that that and who, who, whose reason is tied to kind of a social perspective and you're speaking with clients, how does that conversation go? How does that process work? Yeah, well, I think it's it's always an interesting dialogue uh, to have with the client because, like you say, in architecture, people know. Landscape, people don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, landscape architect, oh, you, you garden or what do you do? <laughs> and, or, you know, the, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bigger thing. And so part of the awareness of the profession is key. But that being said, yeah, you what what really I think the, the means of, uh, using the narrative or storytelling uh, in a way is something that is uniquely human. And um, for even the diehard uh, people uh, that we have worked with, you know, characters like, you know, Barry Diller and, and all these guys that are clients, they understand that uh, connection through storytelling or narrative. So it's much more easy for them to understand the what they're embarking on or what the potentials are or what the place has been and of course you you know if it's a, a fiscally minded person then it's part of your challenge as a designer um, to to be able to bring out that sort of the, the benefits of, of the, either the ecology or the placemaking or whatever you're doing to them in, in language that they can understand. Um, you, 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 it'd be very hard for me to start talking in a poetic way to, you know, some guy that really just knows numbers and bottom line. And if you then can translate because everything can be translated to different things, but hmm. in certain landscapes, if it's a, financial thing like it's important that you actually collect the mycorrhizal in the soil and you build the soil correctly so that and you put that extra money in for that because long term the soil is then going to support the plant life which is then going to to uh, have happier conditions so that your maintenance crew will not have to maintain this as vigorously as most landscapes because the soil is doing the work for you and all the bugs and everything else that are in it, that soil. So you don't need to, you can off the top save 10, 20% off your maintenance budget and long-term conditions. And by the way, that tree or whatever will, you know, earn you money because as things I mentioned earlier, there's these elements, uh, these metrics that um, they can understand uh, when it's important uh, to, to have green and to have trees and the financial benefits of having that that landscape because you'll 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 see I mean you you can literally there you can look at the economic viability of street tre of trees of retail and stuff that have trees on it compared to ones that don't. And of course, they will always jump that, well, why do I want a tree? It's going to drop leaves. It's going to blah, blah. It's going to die. And, and um, it, there's no good, it's just a, a, an annoyance 
for me. So, you know, and they, they go at all costs to try and chop them all down. Well, the reality is, is they actually do provide shade. They do provide that sort of physical connection to nature. Um, that is, but it really financially, you, you watch, you know, you should be thinking about how, what side of the street that your shop or whatever your, your office building is on, you know, and if, it's the sunny side, then you're going to want protection. Are you going to put your money in a very expensive architectural canopy, or are you going to just put it on a very inexpensive tree and just make sure the soil's right and that you get the pavement system correct? I mean, you have to start to think about um, in those kind of financial numbers when you're talking to someone that that's what they talk about. Right. Now, if that same condition I was talking to a city planner, then it would be a totally different conversation because that you could then talk about the same sort of principles and everything, but then the quality of life that will be created by that canopy of tree and by what it would do to increase pedestrian movement. You know, I mean, you've been in LA, you know, when you go on this, you park in the parking lot or if you park on the side streets, cause there's no parking on the, on the road. And then you, you basically walk out on Melrose and there's no trees and you're being baked by the white concrete and the reflection. And then you, you're, and then you're slammed by the off gassing of the asphalt, you know, and then all of a sudden you go to a different, you know, part where there, there's, there are trees. Um, and it's a totally different experience. So there is a, uh, it's very ephemeral. So you're quite, Correct. It's very hard, I think, for some people to think in black and white to understand the grayness of, of landscape and its benefits. You know, I'm, I'm wondering the storytelling aspect of design for landscape architecture and many other professions is one that, that we buy into. It certainly is powerful um, from a kind of design process uh, perspective. Um, it's, it's powerful and potent in terms of conveying ideas to clients, perhaps. Um, the kind of third link that uh, we were talking about the other day is, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it's important for the end users, who let's assume are not the client, right? They, they don't, they, they never converse with you directly, for them to kind of pick up what that narrative or story is, or is it, or or is the value of those things just as a driver in the process? Does that make sense? I, I do. I think it, it's both. I, I in some ways. Um, um, we're we're not really into like you know uh, when, when you do storytelling it it, it 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 creates a narrative and the spatial product of it all but it's not about hitting someone over the head with what you're trying the story that you're trying to convey hmm. what it's about is piquing that curiosity of them like why is it this way why is all of a sudden that's a different material or I've never seen that before why am I processing in my brain that this is something special or this is something different. And with a good story, um, people will read whatever they see in that story every time. Uh, I'm always fascinated that, um, but, but, but to get people to think about there is a narrative or a story is just as important, if not to what the actual story is because it means that they're engaging with their environment, which means they're going to appreciate it more and they're going to want to come back. I mean, the whole point is that with the story is that you don't usually get to the end all the time. You, it tends to ramble on. And so every time you pick up that book or to read, you know, it's, it's all fresh. So that's part of creating landscapes and, and, and environments that um, want people to come back and revisit and create their own stories in. And because it's intellectually stimulating or physically challenging, um, that's when <clears throat> people will engage with it. People always want to sit on the edge hmm. and be in that dynamic um, moment um, rather than sitting in the middle looking at something. And, and I think scaling and, and place making become really important into creating that dynamic sort of vital edge condition <clears throat> and challenging too. I mean, 
you, you said earlier, and it's quite true, the safety people have won the world, but, you know, I would love it if they would bump into things a lot more. I think creating <clears throat> perception that there's, you know, a challenge in front of you is way more stimulating and interesting than than doing nothing. Um, and, and that's part of the, that storytelling help talk about it. I mean, um, it, it, we're, we're right now doing in San Francisco, doing Uber's headquarters. And um, it was part of one of those crazy master plans that uh, was very formal streets and they had built it. And because uh, shop architects we're working with are on both sides of this sort of midway crossing thing, uh, the, the landscape, we were able to rethink, well, is the formal way street tree thing working for everybody right now? Not really. And so we literally dug into the site and as one might know, it's the Bay mud and that it used to be a part of the Bay. And when we were digging, we literally discovered portions of the seawall that had been done in the, in the early teens. And so, that became a language or a, a mechanism to blow up the street and remake it in a way that is about creating beautiful edges and eddies um, with large stone blocks that recall the seawall and the paving materials uh, reinforce sort of the, the dynamic patterns of the, of the bay, uh, you know, levels moving back and forth during the day. And then spilling out into these little secret rooms with diverse plant material that would have been along the edges that are really rich. It's, it's not your agapanthus and raphaeleptus and the street tree of the day. It's much more <laughs> lush. It's about, you know, creating these meadows uh, in the middle of the city that will promote um, people to, to, to breathe to finally breathe it's 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 in its disruption it's it's created this sense of calmness uh at the same time and so uh i expect when it's finally opens and hopefully after this pandemic um will allow people that are within the two buildings to uh and the neighborhood uh to, to flow in and occupy these spaces and sit on the boulders and, you know, you might have to step up to get on one of these boulders or, you know, and of course there's visually conditions that look like they're even more challenging, but we've, we've made them safe by planting them out. We haven't done it by putting caution tape and yellow markers everywhere. Um, and so then, and that'll be a challenge even I think later on, because you're always going to have people that are going to come in after you've done something and try and make it safe by doing a whole bunch of things. And usually there's a dialogue on where that happy medium, if, if right. it's even warranted at all. Right, right. And, you know, it's interesting also because you said you went into, when you went to Harvard, you studied uh, landscape architecture, uh, but then also uh, urban design. Is that right? Yes, yeah. And it, I basically, it was a, I did the first year fully of landscape, and then I started the urban design program with uh, Rodolfo and Machado and uh, Silvetti that they were in, uh, ruling the day at that point. And it was one of those things where uh, that summer before I had done this, um, I, I, I was introduced to uh, George Hargraves, uh, who was a professor at the school at the time based in San Francisco and was told I should work for him for the summer. And that's what I did. And uh it was only a six person office. And so this international competition for the world expo in Lisbon happened. So it was just, he, myself and, and Glenn, uh, just did it. Uh, and what happened was basically send it off and, you know, went back to school. And then, uh, I got a fax to get that from George saying we won. And so, in the middle of the urban design, I talked to them and they said, are you crazy? You just won this international competition. Take a break and do that. So what I did was uh, I worked, I figured out that I could work nine months straight um, from 
uh, by only showing up for the, the spring semesters. Hmm. And so I had to sort of extend the stay at the GSD. So uh, basically the second year I was between Portugal and San Francisco working on this project. And then, uh, and uh, so that was sort of how I, I got involved in all that kind of stuff, which then led to the Sydney Olympics um, with George. And then the firm got bigger and he became the chairman of the GSD. So it was all very exciting times, I think, because uh, he was really challenging the notion of, of uh, palm cest and uh, yeah. ecology uh, at the same time. So uh, he was very much an influence and a mentor uh, to me, I think, at that period of time in my life. That's a wonderful story. And, you know, from your education and then also the way you, your practice runs and the different projects you take on, I'm wondering what similarities or differences do you see across the uh, professions of, let's say, architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design? Because sometimes I wonder, I, I understand why the distinctions between the three would be perhaps necessary, but sometimes I wonder if it's uh, kind of a ridiculous thing uh, uh, on one hand. Well, I sort of agree with the ridiculous part, mainly because I guess, you know, I started off as an architect and I'm now a landscape architect, urban designer, and I come from a family of structural seismic civil engineers. So I think part of the um, opportunities is that we can, that we know how to speak everyone's language, hmm. which a lot of people don't do and so when you can talk to someone with their own words and their and understand what they're trying to tell you if you're talking to an engineer or, or even an architect it's a little closer with architecture but but basically that means of communication makes people feel more relaxed and that you understand them and that there's more opportunities to take things in different directions uh, or there's more willingness to do that. Um, and so I think when it comes across, uh, it, you know, the, the, the structure that the architect uh, is the conductor and maestro and, you know, godlike character, mm -hmm. you know, over the years has slowly worn off. There's, you know, and um, I think like George Harris and these other ones really challenged that these urban environments should be run by architects uh, and more by landscape architects. And I think because it's much easier um, to talk about uh, parks and softscapes in a, in a positive way rather than, you know, some of the monumentality and, 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 things that the profession of architecture had taken itself down uh, and gotten to, that that mm -hmm. so a little break in the chink in the armor allowed uh, landscape architects and urban designers to sort of break in to that world. And I think it's gotten a lot richer. So I think the mushiness or blurring of the lines on who's running what and where uh, is a good thing. And uh, I, I do think I appreciate uh, more characters that have crossovers on everything um, because it becomes much more refreshing. Now, do I like the one shop stop places? You know, I, I, I actually sort of disagree in some levels, like, you know, not to call any firms in LA, but they would do architecture and landscape or whatever, you know. What ends up happening is, is, is I, I do believe this, is that that dialogue, because it's under one roof, mm -hmm. one of them or, or both of them end up getting diminished because um, someone has to be the boss or make the end decision. And I think um, people take on these roles. And so I don't think people's voices are so much heard when it's a one shot thing. But I do think that people that have backgrounds in the various fields and who can outreach to each other, create a much more rich uh, and sympathetic uh, kind of project and have a lot more fun. I mean, really, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what we really, if a project isn't fun, I don't know if we do it, you know, if it's not a challenge, if it's not like something that's promote or, or prog 
progress the profession or or one's or people's environment that we live in, then, you know, we're not that interested, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying uh, regarding, uh, you know, kind of having separate offices and them collaborating. It seems like assuming they're good people and they're not assholes, that it would be yeah. fun, you know, and and even yeah. if you're as fun. much an expert on one topic as they are, they're in a different part of the world. I mean, physically, they're maybe in the same city, but they're different space, different headspace, different everything. It just yeah. seems like, again, if they're good people, it could be quite productive. Because right. <laughs> most... everyone brings everything to the table. Yeah. I mean, your whole yeah. life experience as a designer, you're constantly like a sponge absorbing everything, materials, art, passion, people, everything, movies, film, you know, everything is influencing who you are. And then that has been brought to the table. And, and that's why I think diversity, like, if you go to our office, we're 33 people, but I always laugh that we're a bunch of misfits because <laughs> basically everyone's from everywhere and we all like to see the world, you know, in a wacky sort of way and with an open eyes, not closed eyes. And so when you're working the teams, it's, I have an amazing office full of characters that, that really are passionate about what they do. And, and when you collaborate with them, you go on these streams that you would have never have thought of, you know, someone from, uh, we have a couple of people from Brazil. And so like, okay, let's think about it different. You know, it's, let's be more fluid about this or, you know, in, in just the approaches to problem solving are also different. Um, and so I think that is really that, that enrichment through diversity is, is so important, um, to making successful landscapes because, not all one person that's going to enjoy them. Interesting. Is there one particular project type that you have uh, yet to do that you really want to? Uh, that is a very <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, we, we had the same discussion after the book. I mean, it's maybe uh, institutional uh, kind of work. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it's, it's a good question. It's kind yeah. of like, what, what's left? <laughs> no, no, Dave, yeah, it's, you know, we've been so fortunate to work on so many different things. And when, at one point we said, yeah, more museums. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, we're going to work on the Bay Area uh, Discovery Museum. And then, uh, and then we won the uh, competition for the Crocker Art Museum with Olsen Kundig. And then, mm -hmm. like, all these museums all sort of happened <laughs> after you sort of, like, had it in your brain all of a sudden. So I think, I, I don't think they're... I think we're open to everything and um, we really, I mean, yes, maybe we should have a focus, but it, it really is, um, opportunities. I think, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's a really great question, David, that I'm poorly answering. So I, I, <laughs> I mean, you guys are truly all over the map and that's what makes, I think the firm very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I I, I kind of do wonder though. Is there a certain level of uh, I don't fear is maybe not the right word, but but uh, well, I'll, I'll use it anyway. I kind of fear or concern when you approach a new uh, a new project because presumably you're in some ways less an expert because that's not the only thing you do. Does that make sense, or is that part of the fun, perhaps? It is part of the fun. I think it is very not knowing everything. I mean, no one can know anything, and every solution is a thousand million solutions to absolutely every question. Nothing. No, there's no real right answer or a wrong answer mm. to these. Things. So having a little bit of, uh, I think we just say butterflies in the stomach sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> about uh, what your approach is or how you, you, you're going to strategize to get this project built or presented or thought about, or, you know, even if you got something wrong, it's okay to get things wrong. I think that's one thing that everyone needs to sort of learn. It's okay to mess up because you learn from when you mess up and, you know, nothing can be not undone. And so I think when you're in the process or whatever it could be, um, Solutions can be made to, to rectify the, the the issue or whatever it is at the time. Yeah. So, 
but that's a learning experience, and that's, it's an important thing. I think someone that holds their cards too tight or, um, as I call it, the diamond shitters of the world when you throw <laughs> a lump of coal up their ass and they shit diamonds because they're so intense and need to get it exactly perfect and right. exactly the right way, I think, are doing themselves and their own body damage because <laughs> right. they're, they're literally, you know, um, making them psyching themselves out right. to something that they can never achieve because you can't, can't, per, you can't achieve perfection. I just don't believe that mm-hmm. I think. And when you do, it's stale and it's done hmm. and it's over. Hmm. And I think that, um, having looseness and, and, and knowing that nothing's ever perfect, um, it's sort of a relief. Interesting. Uh, a couple final questions. The first, I was wondering, what was Pierre Koenig like? He was amazing. Uh, <laughs> he was this funny, super quiet. Really? He was like this sort of um, uh, um, approachable, but very, um, uh, how would I say it? He, he's sort of slightly reclusive. You know, he was sort of this very gentle person who had very strong ideas and were able to achieve them in a period of time. And it was actually, it was great when he was building his, his house at the time when I was a student and um, we used to go to the site and see the construction of the I beams and and how he was putting the whole thing together. And and it was awesome. And uh, I remember because it was a, like a benefit is like, he wanted different furniture, so he gave me these Eames couches. <laughs> I'm, like, Here, you these? I'm like, sure. <laughs> I have no problem. Uh, yeah, I think he was just that way. He was just one of those visionary, mild-mannered, uh, but very strong. You know, it's like the you know the strength in his in his silence um, was really mm-hmm. important and and very much alive. He was a very it was great. I mean, I do treasure those times, uh, in that period when I was in architecture school, because it really was, that when it was postmodern, a crazy time. And, yeah. you know, and he was still holding true to the modernist ethic and rightly so, you know, I think, um, you know, it was a, a, a different period in architecture. And so it's interesting, but it's also interesting to see how even that time has in, impacted my peers. So I was classmates with Mark Lee. I don't know if you know Mark Lee Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark and I went to USC together and then went to the GSC together and we've always wildly overlapped each other. And I really love and appreciate the architecture that he has created, you know, and I, I definitely see the strength between that sort of in moment in time and, and how he sees the world and how it's manifested in his architecture um, and find it fascinating, you know. So um, that's the other part, I think, that I always do tell everybody that, you know, um, it's very important to maintain your friendships with, with all your your classmates, but also, uh, your professional peers, Hmm. because especially in landscape architecture, where it's so small, I mean, literally everybody knows everyone and you know what, everyone looks out for everyone. And that's really great. That doesn't always happen in the architecture side because I know there's a lot of knives (laughs) in the back, but in the landscape profession, I think maybe it's just because what we do and that we're so small, um, a group, and there's always sort of a need for landscape architecture um, that there isn't that same kind of um, uh, relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're much more uh, about helping each other out or, you know, you can always call someone if something or you need something, uh, you know, call about Michael Van Balkenberg or whatever, or what did you do here? Or those kinds of things are, uh, or David even, you know, I'm, Hey David, I need someone in LA that can do this and that. And, and there's absolutely no hesitation in picking up the phone. And that's part of why I really love and appreciate the landscape profession. 
I could see that. I wonder where that comes from, you know, if it's because landscape architects are more sensible people in general, so they're far more sensible to each other. It's than possible. Architects. It's possible. Yeah, I think you're onto something. I, I do. I think we're a lot more sensitive about, you know, how, you know, things, things, funk, I mean, how you relate to things in, in, the, in the natural world and know it's very dynamic. And then, you know, you have to count on people to, to get things done. And I think that's really important. I also think it's uh, um, being through the architecture education, which I loved and thrived in, is also at that time was very harsh. I yeah. think it was you know, the critique and the shred and the, all the long hours and the sort of, of course, you build um, stamina and trust and with your classmates and all that kind of stuff. It's really an amazing, you know, kind of environment to be in a studio like that and to do it. But it also is very harsh when it came to f critics and, you know, really, you know, the process of, of dressing down people and their design or their world, I think, was not that beneficial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that last that holds over in the profession, I think. Yeah, yeah no, I, I totally agree with that. The final question is kind of a lighthearted oh. one. But oh, final. You have another question? Well, one of my questions would have been, um, what do clients ask you like the most? <laughs> Will they ask for the most? Yeah, like w what is the, the question that you hear coming from clients the most? Ah, uh, what coming? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> How much is it going to cost? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what architects hear the most, but like, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, it's a really sort of a quandary, actually. I think they do look at landscape not knowing what the hell you do. Uh, <laughs> they know they need you. They know round about what it is. So they don't really come with that kind of a question, right. really, um, because they don't even know that, that how to ask the question. I think what they do is that they, they um, at least our clients are more, in, they're, they're very worldly. And so they do really want to understand what a landscape architecture a, a professional does and how they can, you know, uh, what we always have to do when we meet a client is, is if it's a residential, we're giving them almost a Rorschach test because we're showing them a thousand different types of landscape so that they can respond to and say, well, I like that. I don't like that. Or mm -hmm. well, because the number of times you hear someone saying, I just want a, a Japanese or some Zen garden thing um, with bamboo just because that's the only landscape that they know is a landscape. Um, so, that through that education process, I think w you start conversations and I think it just gets richer and richer and they learn more about how you see the world and, and hone in on exactly what they want because they don't know what they want mm -hmm. because it right. doesn't relate to them. So, um, because it's ephemeral and it's a living thing, you know, it's always, I think the biggest thing that we ever have to do, if you ever want to know what the biggest thing that a landscape has to do is the fight for trees. Trees really? are one of these things that everyone thinks like, I love trees. Trees are the most wonderful thing. I want trees. And, you know, when you get gets down to it, especially in commercial projects and everything, like they just don't want trees, you know, like the, they drop things and everything like that. If I, if I had a dime for every time I had to fight for a tree, I'd be a billionaire by now. Is that because of the maintenance that, that yes, it takes? Yes, absolutely. The but, it, but they're a living thing. That's what people don't, you know, need to understand that trees are living things. And I always use the scenario. I always say, you know, a tree is just like you. It has a personality. It has a form. Uh, you lose your hair every day. <laughs> You're losing particles of hair. You just don't know it. And so you have to clean up your hair every once in a while. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a thing. And then sometimes you lose your hair all at once. Which is maybe not a bad thing, because then you can just shave your head rather than having to, you know, uh, <laughs> you pick up your hair all the time. So, and I do the relationships, the trees that way, because I, you know, you, you, you make them relatable, that then, then they'll understand that it's okay to have leaves drop every once in a while. Or we're designing this landscape so that in the autumn, 
you lose all your leaves and your only maintenance crews are only cleaning them once, not all year. Okay. So there's, you know, these different strategies that are going to work for different people. But trees are always the ones because they'll block my shade, they'll block my view, they're going to drop everything. There's the sticky stuff on the car because they have aphids and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's, I could tell you everything you want to know. They're going to pull up my sidewalk. They're going to blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's the biggest struggle, I think, for landscape architects is to um, fight for the trees and to fight to get the right environments for the trees to grow in. Because as soon as you pick the right tree, make sure your soil's right, and design the pavement systems around them, they'll grow and take care of themselves. Yeah. It'll be fun. That's amazing. I would have not guessed that. I mean, uh, even as a you know practicing architect, I know the benefits of trees. I and mean, it's, it's kind of shocking you'd have to argue so so often for them. I mean, it, it's, trees are what make can make a bad street into an amazing street, like just with trees. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, so. I totally agree. But there's <laughs> majority of the people don't agree when it's their own property. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Uh, the last thing I was wondering is just for a fun question is, uh, what's your favorite spot to eat? Your favorite restaurant in, uh, let's say, well, I, I suppose anywhere, but let's say San Francisco. In San Francisco, my favorite uh, would have to be Zuni. So Zuni sits on Market Street, and it's one of those flat iron conditions. And mm. um, they have, it's almost, we call it the fish bowl, but this glass on the two points. Um, and the uh, food is, uh, it was Judy Rogers, and she was at the forefront of sort of fresh California food. And Zuni chicken is to die for with the bread, the bread uh, salad. It's just incredible. They... Um, so I highly recommend it. And, and literally, if you go in there, you find Debbie, and Debbie makes the best margaritas on the planet. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. That's do they the do a sidewalk <laughs> pickup right now? <laughs> me they are i was i was so heartened to hear that they are doing something because um they're uh, just a, a lovely group of people and the food is incredible and the architecture is beautiful in 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 that eclectic sort of way that you go up and down and around in in the upper levels and you know it's it's, it's uh it's an experience definitely all right, that's one more for the list. Well, James, this has been fantastic. We really appreciate you uh, coming on the show uh, virtually, and hopefully we'll get a chance to meet up, you know, when everything kind of cools Absolutely. down. If and, you don't decide to I retire really... in, in, in Napa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. I really do appreciate you guys t taking this on the, and, and the Midnight Charette because I, I, it's important to be have a voice, um, not only for our profession, for your profession and the design community as a whole. Thank you. Um, we make things beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> we try to, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And leave us a review on iTunes if you want to support us. Uh, those are, I know they're difficult to come by. I know it's cumbersome, but really it means a lot. So if you have the capacity and you have fingers... <laughs> and you have access to an electronic device, then please do leave us a review. Those uh, really mean a lot. What if you're um, an architect and you do not have fingers? Please get in touch with us. I am curious to talk to you. Yeah, figure it out. Um, beyond that, we are on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. You can find us on all of those. Uh, also, reach out to us, of course, via the hotline again, which is 213-222-6950. And we are on all the social medias, right? Yes, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can also find a lot of our episodes on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can subscribe there and uh, leave us a comment yep, on yep, any yep. specific episodes. And our website has all the previous episodes as well. Um, again, we really appreciate your support and uh, it's been good, right? We look forward to speaking with you next week or sooner. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.